service telling people to check they should X. In our state, a check is an invalid ballot. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. I'm a county clerk, and that's what makes me so knowledgeable. Which county oh. are you? Lake County. Oh, okay. like
kind of foundation you said that was? Firm foundation? I thought you said an old foundation or a new foundation. Thank you, Peter, uh, of Massachusetts, Education Training Council, Natalie Gray of Florida, Resolutions Committee, Carolyn Holmes of New Jersey, Rules and Bylaws, Melvin Kennedy of West Virginia, Committee on State Participation, Dick O'Neill of California, for the Compliance and Review Commission, Susan Bartholomew of Louisiana, Joe Pringle of New York, Bill Daly of Illinois, and Helen Heller of uh, Mississippi. And to confirm that as permanent treasurer of the DMC, Peter Kelly, the executive committee also approved the following charter amendments. Well, let's get that going. We'll come back to it. Well, uh, morning in the room.
should adopt this amendment to make our participation on convention committees open to candidates with 15% of the delegates from a given state. I urge you to support the amendment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think a little unclear as to the exact language. 15% uh, figure would be agreeable, but I do think that we are dealing with the final call of the convention, and I think that we should let Mr. Driver very carefully draft a uh, memo so that we know exactly what's being done. And I think that we should maybe consider this order of business in a few minutes when we get this so that we're sure that we know what the net effect of it is. I have no objection. Would you agree to postpone the final uh, uh, resolution of your amendment until we can see exactly what language you're changing? Because I'm a little confused uh, and how, how much language you're changing. Right. Fine, thank you. And we'll postpone this. With, uh, without uh, objection, I'll postpone this until he can get it exactly in writing what we're doing. No objection. Fellow Democrats, today we adopted the final call to the Democratic Convention of 1980. As of this moment, the campaign
presidential vetoes were volunteered by Jimmy Carter even before he took office. As a member of a minority, as a black person, it's also my great honor to introduce Jimmy Carter. Here's a man who not only talks affirmative action, but he deals in it. In one area alone, Jimmy Carter has appointed more black and minority federal judges than all the presidents previously of the United States combined. One area alone. For the first time in history, the White House begins to reflect America. I think I was there twice in all my many years before this new president. I know practically everybody over there by their first names now. There's access for the first time in history, the most accessible president. So I'm saying to you that we Democrats have a great president and a great opportunity to continue to lead this nation forward. The convention, as I said, the fight for the reelection of Jimmy Carter starts today and here. You have it, we have it, within our hands, the ability to guarantee four more years of the rebuilding of our cities, four more years of peace, four more years of affirmative action, four more years of the courage to tackle the big issues and the vision that is necessary in order to inspire that courage. The president has a brief time here. I could obviously say no more, but I'm sure we all get the message. We're all ready to go to work. So when you come to Detroit in July, <laughs> let's prepare then to renominate and reelect the greatest president of the United States, Mr. <laughs> New York demurred. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Coleman said that was a good poll. <laughs> I would have been here a little earlier, but my carpool was late. <laughs> when I arrived, I noticed that my free parking place had been taken away. <laughs> We have some problems in our country. One of them is energy. I told the Congress today who are going home on recess, leaving Washington, that I could guarantee them enough gasoline to get home. Now the trip back, 
We'll have to look into that. <laughs> Maybe John White, our great chairman, can uh, assess the advisability of a nationwide application of the Killer Bee program. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come here to announce, and I didn't come here to outline past achievements. I want to speak to you this morning in a kind of a rare way for a politician, for a president speaking to his own party leaders and his own personal friends. I intend to answer questions in a few minutes. But first, I want to talk to you about the responsibility that we share as leaders of a Democratic Party. We won a great victory together in 1976. But the words which Adlai Stevenson used at the Democratic Convention still preys on my mind. He said, even more important than winning an election, is governing the nation. When the tumult and the shouting die, he said, there is a stark reality of responsibility in an hour of history. The responsibility for governing this nation belongs to us Democrats. We fought for it and we won this privilege and the American people now are looking closely to see how we discharge this responsibility. Some of that responsibility is very pleasant, very enjoyable, but some of it is very difficult. You can inventory what we've already done in cities, jobs, world peace. But in times like these, it's not adequate, even when democratic leaders assemble, just an inventory of what we have done. The challenge is to look at now, and the challenge is to look to the future, and not to sit here and congratulate one another when our nation still faces troubled times. In times like these, we must make decisions to deal with those problems, to answer those questions in a way that is not always easy and it's not always popular. The founders of our nation wondered whether a government of free people could rise above narrow sectional interests in times of crisis and work for the good of the whole country. That is exactly the challenge that we face today. The American people are disturbed. The American people are doubtful. The American people are uncertain about the future. The American people do not have automatic trust in you or me or other democratic officials. Too many Americans today are watching the spectacle of politicians grappling with the complex problems, for instance, of energy and inflation. They see the demagoguery and they see political timidity and they wonder if we who are in office are equal to the challenge. The American people are looking to us for honest answers, not false claims, not evasiveness, not politics as usual, but they look to us for clear leadership. What they often see here in Washington and elsewhere around the country is a system of government which we love and which we are sworn to protect, which seems incapable 
of action. They see a Congress pushed and pulled in every direction by hundreds of well-financed and powerful special interests. They see every extreme position imaginable defended to the last breath almost, to the last vote by one unyielding, powerful group or another. They often see a balanced and fair approach that demands sacrifice, a little sacrifice from everyone, abandoned like an orphan, without support and without friends. Often they see paralysis, stagnation, and drift. The American people don't like it, and neither do I. This country was not founded by people who said, me first, me last, always. We've not prevailed as a free people in the face of challenge and crisis for more than two centuries by practicing the politics of selfishness. We've not continually enlarged individual liberty, freedom, responsibility, opportunity, human dignity for all the people by listening to the voices of those who say we must have 100% now or nothing, and I will not listen to other voices who are seeking a common goal for our country. The times we live in call for plain talk, call for political courage. Slogans will not do the job. Press conferences will not solve serious problems that we face in inflation, in energy, in maintaining peace in a troubled world. We have already wasted years, as you know, under Republican leadership, looking for quick fixes, often just before a national election. This is a time to tell the American people the truth. The days of the quick fix and the painless solution, if they ever existed, are gone. We can argue, we can debate, we can evade, we can duck, but one fact remains clear. So long as we spend our time searching for scapegoats or weeping or wringing our hands and just hoping for some kind of miraculous deliverance, our problems will get worse. The decisions will get more difficult. The choices will diminish. Our people will get more cynical and the future for our great nation will be less bright. I'm not asking you to support verbatim every recommendation which I make. The question today is not whether government reaches solutions which any of us support 100%. The question is whether government on these extremely difficult questions can reach any acceptable solution at all. The issue is not one of political philosophies, but a failure of will and a failure of the political process itself. The bottom line is clear. We need positive political solutions in America today, not just a sustained record of negative votes to appease some special powerful political group back home. Whatever solutions we offer, there should be no illusions in the Democratic Party. No one in public office in Detroit or in Washington can escape having to make difficult decisions. Every public official lives in Harry Truman's kitchen and there is no way of avoiding the heat if we're going to meet the responsibilities of leadership which the American people have given to us. 
As president, I've made mistakes, but I have made and I will continue to make decisions without fear, which call for you and for your states to make some sacrifice. These decisions will not always be popular. But I didn't seek the president presidency for two or three or four years with my utmost capability because I wanted to live in some self-imposed comfort in the White House. I sought this office to lead our country. And I will never duck any decision which is vital to the welfare of this nation just because the popularity polls might go down. You are leaders of our party. I need your help and support. And those of us, among those of us who are in positions of responsibility today, if we are unwilling to take the heat to make unpopular decisions, to stick together in a semblance of unity, to fight difficult battles without fear, to set our goals high, to be inspired, to recognize the potential greatness of our country, to stand up and fight when it's necessary, to offer answers to compli complicated and complex questions when we know there's no easy way. If we don't do these things, then we, we, will, we will have failed in our own hour of history. The Democratic Party has a great history. Democrats have never been elected to office just because we wanted to avoid problems to offer a timid course or a simple solution in difficult times. We are the party of the people, not just because we most often win a majority of the votes, but because we believe in an America that's united by a common purpose and not united by a conglomeration of special interest. Ours is a nation, ours is an America that lives on hope, hope based on a real expectation of fulfillment, not based on fear. If we are true to these principles, to these values, if we are true to that faith, then we will meet the challenge of leadership in the Democratic Party today. Together, we will succeed in our present task. And under those circumstances, I have absolutely no doubt that we will win again in 1980. Thank you very much. I'd like to answer a few questions. We have some minutes. I think there are some microphones, so, and you'll have to go to the microphone if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. President, we are today the party in power, the dominant party. You are our public and party leader. And yet, Mr. President, it often appears that you may be reticent to fully exercise the entire prestige and power of those positions to bring about all these solutions which you espouse. Could you comment on that, please? Yes, I'll try. I didn't take this opportunity today to, to list the things we've done. 
the uh, consummation of a Panama Canal Treaty after 14 years of fruitless effort, the bringing together of Israel and Egypt in a successful peace treaty after 30 years of warfare and hatred and death and destruction and divisiveness, or the conclusion of a SALT agreement after seven years when it had been unsuccessful, or the presentation to the Congress of these difficult issues which they have so far successfully resolved. And I didn't talk about civil service reform and a reduction in the unemployment rate by 25 percent and the rejuvenation of our cities like Detroit. I haven't talked about those things. But there, there are many areas of life that still prey on my mind and uh, feel on my shoulders as a responsibility that we have not successfully addressed. And I need your help with them. And I'd like to respond to this question without blaming other people. There's enough blame to go around when we don't succeed. And I know that the president has that responsibility as a preeminent person. And I get my share of the blame, and I am not too weak to take it. Now, energy is becoming the burning issue in our country. In 1980, I predict to you that how we handle the energy question is going to decide who wins and who loses because the American people are interested in seeing, can we work together? Before I ever took oath of office, for the first time in the history of our nation, in spite of devastating potential consequences because of an absence of an energy policy, we put one together in 90 days. And I have put more time on energy than I have SALT, the Mideast, Panama Canal treaties, or any other foreign policy question all put together. And on April of 1977, I presented to the Congress a comprehensive, reasonable energy proposal. And I have been scorned and ridiculed by the press or others because I said this was a moral equivalent of war and that we actually have a very serious question. In, in many ways, I have been a lonely voice up until this moment. We've got a serious energy question, not only in the United States, but around the world. The Congress passed about 60, 65 percent of all of our energy proposal after almost two years of begging and pleading and threatening and hard work. They did not pass one sentence about oil. Now, I recognize it's a difficult proposition because our nation is not only one of the largest users and wasters of oil, but we're also one of the largest producers of oil. And the producers of oil have a powerful lobby, perhaps the most powerful lobby on earth. And the Congress has not acted yet on a single issue that relates to oil. Nobody here has forgotten about 1973, 1974, when we had gas lines. The situation has not improved. We're running now two or three million barrels a day, less oil being produced than we're consuming on a worldwide basis. And American production of oil has been going down about 6% per year for the last 10 years. It is obvious to anyone that looks at it that we've got a problem that's serious now. It's going to get more serious in the future. We're going to have less oil. We're going to have to pay more for it. Those are facts. They are unpleasant facts. And so far, the American people, whom I do not want to condemn, and the Congress of the United States, whom I do not want to condemn, have refused to accept that simple fact. We are now using, for instance, in California, 7% more gasoline than we used a year ago. And we have less gasoline to go around. We're trying to plant crops in Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Ohio, and madly trying to move enough diesel fuel so the tractors won't stop, trying to build up reserve supplies of fuel in New England to heat homes this fall. And the Congress has still not given me the authority that I have asked for. They rejected, including the Democrats, the proposals that I have made on rationing not even willing to give me the authority to hold down waste of illumination in buildings and on billboards, not giving me the authority if the governors fail and request it to reduce the sale of gasoline one day a week, not even willing to give me the authority to develop a standby rationing plan, just to develop one that could not go into effect 
unless a crisis existed and the President and the Congress agreed to put it into effect. I don't, I'm not blaming the c Congress because the American people have not yet demanded this. They think that somehow or another a miracle is going to occur. And, and a lot of oil is going to be released from secret hiding places. And if the, if the federal government and the oil companies would just quit cheating everybody, the energy problem is going to go over. That's not going to happen. <laughs> the Congress has got two proposals this year on inflation. Real wage insurance to tell the working people whom you and I care about, if you'll agree to hold down your wage demands and the, inter and the inflation rate goes up, we'll give you a tax reduction so you won't lose by trying to be patriotic. I have not been able to get that legislation out of committee. And the other bill that we have proposed to the Congress is on hospital cost containment. And I said a few minutes ago that the oil companies had the biggest and most powerful lobby. It's almost matched by hospital owners and doctors, many of whom are the same people. And you think, where is the competitive nature of health care. Who keeps the hospitals from putting people in their beds unnecessarily, performing operations that are not necessary? If somebody's going to be operated on Tuesday morning, put them in the bed on Friday so the hospital can derive more profit. Perform procedures that are not necessary. That's what we're trying to stamp out. I'm having a terrible time getting that bill out of the Ways and Means Committee. I can't get it out of the Commerce Committee in the House. And I admit that this failure that I've just described to you is to a major degree my fault. Maybe if I was a better politician, I would have got these bills through the Congress. I've done the best I could. I have never backed down. I'm going to continue to fight. But I guarantee you almost this, that if everybody in this room would put 10% as much time trying to get hospital cost containment passed and to deal with our energy problem, I believe we could succeed. What member of Congress as a Democrat could stand up against you? Very few. We're coming up now with salt. I'll, I have one life to live on this earth. I've got one political career. And I will never face an issue, unless our country actually goes to war. God knows, I hope it doesn't happen. But absent that, I will never face an issue so important as getting salt ratified by the Senate. I won't tell you all the reasons now. <laughs> but, but, I, but I need you to help me with it. Not in a quiet way saying, I think that's a great idea, I hope it passes. But in there fighting for it. And I haven't made my announcement about what I'm going to do in 1980. But I've never backed down from a fight I've never been afraid of a public opinion polls, and if and when I decide to run, it would be in every precinct in this country, no matter who else ran, and I have no doubt that it would be successful. Because we've got a good record, and if we can prevail on these three issues, energy, inflation, and salt, we'll have an even better record. And I think with the courage that you ask me to exhibit, and I'll do the best I can to alleviate your concerns, if you'll help me, we'll win. Because we deserve to win. Not because we're Democrats, because we deserve to win. Thank you. 
the Democratic nominee and feel that we have offered the best the entire time. I waited a while before I supported Jimmy Carter because simply I thought I was supporting one of the greatest men that I've ever had the privilege of supporting, and that was Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. I was assured that Hubert Humphrey was not going to be a president, the presidential candidate again. I've had the pleasure of supporting the man that I placed in the same category that I placed Hubert Humphrey. A man of conviction and courage and vision who has really led the Democratic Party in one in which we can be proud. And I want you to know that I feel that I speak for the majority of the group of people here, as well as the majority of the group of people in America, that we want Jimmy Carter as our president again. We want to see him again. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, this is one of those, that's one of the best questions I've ever had, by the way. <laughs> you know, I've sweated over this energy thing in the face of repetitive disappointments. We put forward a co tax last year, you remember, a crude oil equalization tax that would have decontrolled oil, brought into the government a substantial amount of money. And uh, we couldn't get it out of the Senate committee. Now we, we've got a, a good package. Decontrol will be phased in over 28 months, slow, steady, and controllable. We can watch what goes on. We'll tax the oil companies heavily, and I don't care if the Congress makes it a little bit heavier, as the price of oil goes up, either because of OPEC or because of decontrol here, with a windfall profits tax. That profits tax is not a sure thing. It seems like a sure thing now. The day after I made my announcement, everybody said it hadn't got a chance in the world to pass. Now everybody says it's going to pass whether we work or not. It's not. Out of that windfall profits tax, which will grow year by year, we'll create an energy security fund. That energy security fund will be a very important element of dealing with the energy question. It will go, first of all, to help the very poor families who cannot afford the rapidly increasing, inevitable prices of energy. Secondly, it will go to help us with mass transit, because a lot of people either don't have automobiles, or as is the case right now in California, for instance, people are beginning to see that it's better for them to go to and from a fixed destination like a workplace on public transportation. That'll be a great boost. And the third thing is to have a, a substantial amount of money growing every year for research and development to let us have new sources of energy, like solar power, like liquefaction and gasification of coal, like geothermal power, the very things that all of you want. And it will leave the oil companies about 29 cents out of each dollar to put back into the exploration in the United States for increased supplies of oil and gas. To me, it's a balanced program. The Congress is wasting its time now, passing resolutions about are we, or are we not going to decontrol. That serves to cloud the issue so much on the windfall profits tax that it puts it in danger. And, and I hope that, that the Democrats and Republicans, the President and the Congress, all of you and the American citizens will join in together and say, let's pass this package once and for all. I would hate to see it fail, but it's going to require a concerted effort by all those who are interested in the future of our country. It's not, there, is, there is not a single vote, I guarantee you, in the energy question. When I, I have made many mistakes in my life, one of the worst mistakes I made was, a, was an evening in April of 1977 when I told the American public we've never had a comprehensive energy policy. When I proposed this energy policy and fight for it, I said to about 40 million people, 
My public opinion poll is going to go down 15 points. The mistake I made was it has gone down much more than that. <laughs> and I think energy is one reason, but we can't back down. And I'm willing to fight this fight and to win it, and we will win it with your help. My name is George Schwartz from Philadelphia, the birthplace of our nation. And all I want is a little equal time with this mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I am personally the chairman of the host committee for the site selection committee when they come to Philadelphia. June 7th and 8th. I was also chairman of the delegation that came down here several weeks ago to make our presentation. I merely want to bring to your attention the fact that you mentioned Harry S. Truman and Heat in the Kitchen, and I agree with you. In 1948, President Truman was under attack, was under criticism, very much like yourself. And what do you think he did? He came to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very successful convention for Mr. Truman, and he was re-elected. Thank you very much. <laughs> I gotta go. I'm sorry. I've gotta go now, but let me say this in closing to you.